This is perhaps the most significant piece of legislation that's been introduced which will affect the lives of people with disabilities since the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Uh, the legislation provides protection for people with disabilities against discrimination in a broad array of uh, social, economic, uh, cultural activities, including housing, transportation, state and local government services, and uh, employment. We really have to do something in this country to plan ahead to ensure that there are appropriate services available in the community to support people with disabilities living at home and to support older Americans who want to age in place and be independent in the community, full participants, as they wish to be. You know, the biggest hurdle I faced probably was getting over my own uh, profound sense of loss when I was told that uh, I couldn't do something I knew I could do on account of my disability. I don't know if people understand it, uh, really, people who haven't experienced discrimination before, but if somebody tells you you cannot do something on account of a characteristic that you have, and you have no control over that characteristic, and yet you know you can do that, that feels terrible. I mean, it's a feeling you can't describe. You feel it in your gut, you feel it in your heart, you feel it in your soul but you can't describe what discrimination feels like. And only people who've experienced that can really respond appropriately to it, I think. Other people can try to appreciate and be empathetic, but unless you've felt that, you don't understand it. And I, you know, I frankly believe that that lesson is the one that motivated the disability movement, and to the extent that we still have challenges, we'll continue to do so. You know what, I, I'd done very well in school. I didn't have any trouble um, uh, making good grades. And uh, I was interested in a lot of different things. I wanted to be uh, an electronics engineer. This was the late 60s and uh, computers were just being used in industry and academia. And I was interested in the computers. I was also interested in media. So I, I enrolled in Oklahoma State University, a great engineering college there to study electronic engineering. That was probably what I expected to do the rest of my life. It was the 20th of November in 1967. I had graduated from high school earlier that year and started college in Stillwater, Oklahoma at, at OSU. I was uh, riding around that weekend, uh, Sunday night, in the car we were driving four other students. I was in the middle of the back seat, and uh, we had a head-on collision with another carload of students right in the middle of the main drag of Stillwater, Oklahoma. Um, I can remember that the, uh, the other guys in the car with me were scrambling out after the impact of the head-on, and uh, I was just laying there in the middle of the back seat, and I tried to move, but I couldn't, and I realized I couldn't move my legs, I couldn't move my arms. I did not lose consciousness. I mean, I was awake. Uh, I knew what had happened. We had a head-on crash. Uh, not surprising, actually, because the drivers of both cars had been drinking, but uh, nonetheless, it happened. And the ambulance got there and started loading people into the ambulance. Everybody had uh, it, the guy in the front seat of our car on the, the passenger side, his arm went through the windshield. So he had bad lacerations. The driver hit the steering wheel, it broke his ribs and, and uh, affected his, uh, his heart. Um, the guy next to me, his leg was caught under the seat and broke his leg. The guy on the other side of me next to me wasn't hurt. Uh, they all got out and they got in the ambulance and then the paramedics came to get me and they literally had to drag me out of the back seat of this car. Um, onto a stretcher and into the ambulance. Uh, we went to the um, emergency room and on campus. It was actually uh, a clinic for the students. Uh, it was the middle of the night on a weekend and there was one nurse there. That's all. They called the doctor who was on charge uh, and who came down later. He, he happened to be a pediatrician. Um, the nurse triaged everybody. She put everybody who was bleeding 
in the front of the line and the doctor, the one doctor there with 13 students in this accident started to sew people up and, and uh, brace their broken bones and so forth. I was the last one he saw and uh, he said, I think you've got a neurological problem. Uh, we need to take an x-ray and by this time an x-ray tech had got there and they did an x-ray of my back and uh, the doctor looked at it and he said, I don't see anything wrong here. Let me go call a specialist. And he left the, the room and I said to the tech, I said, you know, if you don't mind, why don't you put that camera over my head and take a picture? Because my neck hurts. And uh, he did. And he took the film out and, and I could see it when he took it out. And my neck had been just uh, completely broken and the bones were offset. And uh, after that, I was sent to an emergency room in Oklahoma City. Uh, a few weeks later after surgery and some recovery, I had the good fortune to come to Tear Memorial Hermann in Houston. And uh, so when I got out of rehabilitation, my instincts were to go back to college. I didn't think about going back to college at Oklahoma State University because I had been a student there and I knew the campus was very inaccessible. So it wasn't a practical thing to do. I looked at my options. At this point, my family lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and there was a brand new college that had been built literally uh, from the ground up in the three years preceding that. It was Oral Roberts University. It was on the plains of Oklahoma. It was uh, flatlands. The buildings were all built with level entrances and there were elevators everywhere. It was a new and modern campus. And, uh, I was a, a Methodist and Oral Roberts was a Methodist, so I thought, well, this, this is uh, gonna work very well, and I applied to go to college there. Uh, a few weeks later, I got um, a letter back from the Dean of Admissions that said my application had been uh, denied. And I was befuddled by that. I didn't understand it. I called the Dean and uh, had the fortune to speak to him and said, what's the problem here? I, I sent my application. He, he said, let me check the file. And he said, no, he said, you got the right letter. Your application was denied. I said, did you get my transcript from high school? I was valedictorian in my high school class. He said, yes. Uh, I said, did you get the test scores from the SAT, the National Qualifying Test? Did you see that I was in the top five percentile? And I, I couldn't imagine. I said, what, what then is the problem? Why can't I come to your school? And he said, well, you indicated on your application you use a wheelchair for mobility. And our policy is not to have students with disabilities on our campus. I was speechless. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't speak after that. I, for three days, I couldn't speak. You know, before that moment, I thought things were going to be fine. I thought, you know, with the support of my family, with the uh, strength that I had, with the community becoming more aware and more technical and so on, I thought this was going to be a challenge that I would gladly accept and overcome. But when that man told me that because of my disability I couldn't go to the university, it changed my life. It really, really did. It was so um, profound and I felt so guilty because I'd been the one who'd been out with the boys on Sunday night drinking. I'd been the one who caused my life to change. I was guilty because all of my plans, all of my dreams, all of my hopes for my family, for, for my girlfriend, for my community, I had failed, and uh, it was a terrible, 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 shocking feeling. So after I was turned down for admission to Oral Roberts University, uh, I was depressed. Obviously, I couldn't speak to anybody about it for three days. I was very depressed. I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. My father came home from work one day, said he'd mentioned my dilemma to a co-worker 
who suggested that I go and apply to the University of Tulsa, a college across town from Oral Roberts University. But it was an old school built at the turn of the century with buildings that were uh, filled with steps and ivy walls. Uh, we'd been through the university campus looking at it before and, and I had come to the conclusion that it was not a friendly place to be because it was very inaccessible. But based on uh, my father's encouragement, I made an appointment with the Dean of Admissions there to have a meeting and the Dean said, sure, come on out and I'll meet you and he instructed us where to park. He met us on the parking lot along with the Dean of Students. and. Uh, the reason he met us there was not to show us where to park. It was because there was no place else to get in a wheelchair. We couldn't get up the curb. We couldn't get into his office. There was no place on the campus, literally no place that a wheelchair could go except the parking lot. So we had this meeting outside the, the, the dorms in the parking lot. And uh, the dean said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to college. And I'd like to study engineering. But first of all, I know the engineering campus is three and a half miles from here, and there's no accessible shuttle back and forth to the main campus. And secondly, as I look around here, I don't see a single building I can get into. So the other dean said, you know, if you want to come to school here, I'm sure there are a lot of students and volunteers who can help lift you up and down the steps. And they'd be, we'd be glad to facilitate that. And I said, you know, that would be an imposition on them. And to do that day after day after day, I wouldn't want that. It would also be risky for me to be carried up and down those steps day after day after day. Uh, so I'm not comfortable with that. And, uh, and I said, you know, I'm sorry, but I guess this is just what I have to expect looking forward. The other dean said, you know, we'd really like you to be a student here. You have good grades, you have the intellect, you have the kind of spirit, the, the, the attitude that we'd like to have on our campus. Uh, he said, look at that uh, space across the campus. You can see some, some construction there. He said, that's the first new building we've built on this campus in 15 years. It will have a level entrance and an elevator. And it'll be ready by the time the fall semester starts. And I said, I got a little excited. I said, well, what are you going to teach there? And he said, that'll be biology and life sciences. And then I got depressed again. I said, I, I'm really not interested in biology and life sciences. And he said, look, he said, take the catalog home. Figure out what you want to take. Call me and tell me. And whatever it is, those classes will be in that building. It was perfect, it didn't cost them anything. They didn't have to build anything new. Not a single ramp, not a single new widened door, not a single new elevator. They just moved some of their operation to where I was gonna be. Um, that was a profound experience and one that affected our laws right now. That, that actually led me to the idea that we should be able to have reasonable accommodation that businesses, schools, um, accommodations shouldn't necessarily need to be made that cost a lot of money if there were alternative ways to do them. And that was included in the regulations in the Rehabilitation Act uh, going forward in 1978, they were in, interjected there. And that provision is included in the ADA, the provision of reasonable accommodation. You can figure out a way to do it that easy and doesn't cost too much that's a satisfactory solution. My experience at the university was uh, just one of thousands of experiences that people had that effectively changed their lives, not for the better, but made them just stop, get depressed and quit. And uh, fortunately, I was over able to overcome the sensation that I had when I was told I couldn't do something I knew I could do. Um, because of my disability. Many people weren't able so easily to overcome that. And, uh, and they shared their stories and talked. So uh, overall, I think the whole movement was pushed not by events, single events, but more by a kind of group growing awareness, a group culture and a group momentum. So there is, in my estimation, no one event. What was important was that we had 
dozens and dozens, scores of rallies, scores of meetings. Uh, my friend Justin Dart, a Texan, uh, drove his Toyota truck with his family all over the United States, literally to 50 states three times, meeting with groups of people with disabilities in their communities, in their schools, in their homes, uh, talking with them about the opportunity we might have to get uh, civil rights for people with disabilities, to get non-discrimination law uh, passed in this country. And, uh, you know, those people in those communities, people with disabilities, family members, um, professionals who work with people with disabilities, uh, volunteers, supporters, would come together uh, over coffee. They'd come together in the afternoon on a, on a uh, Saturday afternoon and they'd rally and they'd talk about how important uh, disability rights were and they'd share their own experiences. The disability movement is a self-empowerment movement. The only people who did and who ever will uh, move the movement by people with disabilities to have their voices heard will be people with disabilities. A anytime um, good-willed, uh, good-intentioned people who don't really have personal experience with a certain issue try to move an effort forward, it will fail. Same thing, we saw the same thing in the civil rights movement, uh, people of color. Uh, it had to be spokespeople who had experienced racial discrimination to have an impact. President Johnson had a good attitude and goodwill and wanted to make things better. But not until Martin Luther King began to talk about these issues from a personal perspective was there real change. Uh, same thing has happened in the women's movement. We've seen it in other areas as well. People with disabilities have to be self-advocates. They have to represent themselves, speak for themselves, and work together uh, to cause change. A change for the better. It began with the Vietnam veterans, the wounded among them, who refused to disappear into hospitals and nursing homes. They felt that their country owed them normal lives. They spearheaded what was to become a new movement. The new militants are the disabled citizens of America, demonstrating as best they can. Finally, on April 28, 1977, Section 504 regulations were signed. In human terms, what did the law accomplish? One of the things it did was to provide some money for projects like this one in Houston called New Options for Independent Living. I was asked to testify before Congress in 1983 about the Rehabilitation Act uh, reauthorization and I talked about what we had been doing in Houston to promote independent living by people with disabilities. At the end of my testimony, a congressman from Dallas, Steve Bartlett, said, Lex, if, if there was one thing you could recommend to us that would help improve the lives of people with disabilities that we can affect in policy, what would that be? My recommendation, I said, would be to create a blue ribbon panel uh, that would represent people with disabilities and provide you and the Congress and the President with recommendations to affect policy that would improve the lives of people with disabilities, make us more independent, make us more productive, and make us a part of the community. And the, the, the congressman took that under advisement and said to me after the hearing, come to my office tomorrow morning and maybe you can help me draft an amendment to this legislation that would do what you have suggested. Together we wrote this report and uh, we got to a point where our staff had made a recommendation that the law say there should be non-discrimination on the basis of disability. Many of these council members were anxious about that. They were afraid that President Reagan wouldn't want to be uh, a civil rights advocate. They thought he was more interested in the economy and other matters. Um, we took this report to a vote of the council, 15 members all of them appointed by the president. And at some point they voted 
that day to produce the report and make it available to the President and to the Congress. I think when that council, having studied the matter, agreed that they should recommend to their boss, the President, uh, that he be a civil rights advocate on behalf of people with disabilities, that, that was a, really a signal moment. I think there's probably another important point, which we were supposed to deliver the report to the president. President Reagan had us on his schedule. The space shuttle Challenger, Challenger exploded down range. on the morning we were to meet the president. His, his calendar was canceled. And we were told by his secretary, it's going to be weeks and weeks before we can reschedule you with the president. However, she said, the vice president, George Bush, can meet you next week. And I said, we'll take it. And we met Vice President George Bush, who understood what we were recommending. He said, Barbara and I had a child with a disability who died early on. And we have one of our sons has a disability now. We understand what you're talking about here when you talk about people not being able to do things on account of characteristics over which they have no control. We understand these issues and we would support you. But he said, I'm just the vice president. I'll do what I can. Well, that was uh, 1986, two years later, George Bush was elected president. In his first uh, statement before the joint session of Congress, he said, in my presidency, I want to sign a law that uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of disabilities. Two years after that, on July the 26th, 1990, President George Herbert Walker Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act. And today's legislation brings us closer to that day when no Americans will ever again be deprived of their basic guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so when it comes to the ADA, Houstonians have real reason to have a, a strong sense of Texas pride. And of course, many other Texans have played leading roles in securing equal civil rights for the disabled, and no less list is complete without Justin Dart and, uh, and Lex Fried. I don't, I don't like to think of myself as being particularly influential. I, I was a person who was given an opportunity and I did my best. And I think that's all any of us can do. I was given a unique opportunity. And, uh, and I did as well as I could, and I'm glad it had some good impact. Um, I, throughout my life, I've had the opportunity to have many experiences, to learn many things, and to meet many people. And I've tried to apply uh, my talents, um, my skills, uh, the lessons I've learned from other people, and the lessons I've learned from life to help other folks. And fortunately, I've been able to do that with the work that I've done in the area of independent living by people with disabilities and also in the area of uh, disability rights. Well, there's quite a lot needs to be done. I mean, there are right now in the United States 76 million baby boomers. These are people who were born shortly after World War II. It's the largest demographic bubble in our history. And all of these people are aging and most of them are retiring now. By the year 2020, half of those people will have disabilities. Not because they were in a car wreck or because they broke their neck in a diving accident, but because age catches up with all of us. And whether it's hearing loss, vision loss, uh, difficulty walking, memory loss, all of these kinds of impairments are a function of age. And uh, all of these people want to live in their own homes. They want to live in their community. They want to participate with their families. And yet, if somebody breaks their hip and goes to a hospital in the Texas Medical Center or anywhere else, and they're over 70 years old, the likelihood is that they will be referred to a nursing home and they will spend the rest of their lives in that nursing home. And frankly, that's a death sentence. We have to provide better options in the community so that people can go home and get the help they need in their home. And I'm not talking about nursing services. Yes, we have home health. But I'm talking about attendant services, personal care assistance, so somebody can come in, maybe not with a lot of skills or training, but learn how to help that individual get dressed, 
and get back to bed. Learn how to help them do activities of daily living. Learn how to them help them to function independently in the community despite the impairments that they have. I think that's the biggest challenge really, are the 56 million people with disabilities, a large portion of whom need daily help in order to live independently, to go to work, to go to school, whatever. And we don't have an infrastructure in this country, nowhere do we have an infrastructure that will appropriately provide needed services to people in their homes. I think we all understand uh, that our lives are, are just a piece of the reality of the larger life and, and our little piece of society, our little piece of the world sometimes spin around us, but it's a bigger circle. And uh, I think people with disabilities have begun to take that on too. I think that's what's caused part of the disability movement to move forward and I think that will help to propel uh, the movement forward for years to come.